Okay, so um, thank you for the intro. Um, a, a bit background about myself and my project. Um, I'm not sure this. Okay, so I'm a PhD student in the computer science in Hebrew University. Um, my research uh, was focused for the last six years, I guess, um, on replacing or working and improving Satoshi's uh, proof of work paradigm and protocols. It began with the GOES protocol, which we presented in uh, around 2013-14. Uh, Ethereum implemented a version of this uh, to some extent. Uh, inclusive Spectre, which we presented in Scaling Bitcoin Hong Kong. Uh, and recently Phantom, which we presented in, um, in Stanford BPACE. So we kind of, uh, let me give you uh, just the gist of what these protocols are about. So this won't be a technical talk. It's just uh, to get the flavor of what, what's going on here. So as most of you know, the operation of Bitcoin is a blockchain, a chain of blocks. Um, and when a miner gets a block, it extends the tip of the chain. So you have this nice chain of blocks. But in the block DAG paradigm, instead of um, extending a single chain of blocks, this new block on the right, on your right, so it's time, time flows from the left to the right. This is the genesis block. This is a new block the miner mines. Instead of extending the longest chain of blocks, it extends the entire graph of blocks it observes. So this is the block DAG paradigm. Um, what's interesting about it is that um, it helps you scale up. So there's uh, this parameter k, which sort of represents how, um, how intense is the mining in the DAG. So you see a blockchain on the top, on the top left, a blockchain is sort of a trivial block DAG, just a slow graph of blocks, but you can increase the scalability of the system. And then you have this uh, smaller uh, graph over there, which grows actually faster. And just imagine here 10 blocks per second in the network. This is what you'll see. So again, one block, uh, let's say one block per 10 minutes, this is a, a chain of blocks. But 10 blocks per second, this roughly will look like this. Why different miners in the network will receive different versions of the, of the blockchain. So we have to, to, to merge everything into the same graph. So this is um, towards this is aimed at scaling up the the blockchain. Okay, so so this may or may not look cool, but this is not the main challenge. The main challenge of a block DAG is to recover consistency. So in this large graph, there may be many conflicts, many double spends, and you have to have some protocol that recovers consistency and says, OK, there are double spends, but what's, so what's, what version of the transactions um, remain and what are rejected? OK? So to that end, we devised protocols in the Hebrew University. Um, it's a joint work with um, several people in the Hebrew University, myself, my advisor, Aviv Zohar, another colleague, Yoad Lewenberg. And these are Spectre and Phantom protocols, which again we presented in several venues. Um, and this won't be the topic of today's talk. So this will be the last technical slide for today. OK. So in the remaining time, let me uh, outline what I want to take home uh, key messages I want to talk about today. Blockchain versus centralized databases. What's the value proposition of trustlessness? Um, the fact that trust exists, sorry, in the Bitcoin ecosystem as well. And some conclusions about the two-layer approach. OK, so this, this is sort of a uh, trivial slide that is hard to convince people. Um, it's sort of paradoxical. So anyone who knows blockchain internally acknowledges that it is in and of itself, a technology, a database technology that is inferior to any centralized database. Now, there are many talks in the community how to scale up the system, but we must acknowledge that any 
scaling technology will forever lose to Visa's technology. And we'll get to it shortly why, but, and, and this is not a prediction about adoption, this is a prediction about, this is a statement about the technology itself. And, and the reason is that because we are trying to build a trustless system, this trustless implies lots of scalability limitations, which Visa doesn't have. So any feature that Visa will, that blockchain will have, Visa will probably copy, um, uh, scalability-wise. Um, so today, the, it's 10,000 transactions, um, the capability of Visa at least. Bitcoin is not near that. So whenever someone says, you know, we have a blockchain is more secure, it's not more secure per se, it's not more private per se, and it's slower. But still, it's very valuable. So the main value proposition is that we can achieve many properties of databases. Um, uh, some emphasize more the financial aspect in a trustless manner. And as computer scientists, we prefer to define what trustless means. So some loose define, definition here. If at least uh, in order to disrupt the operation, an attacker needs to control a large portion of, um, of the resources. In proof of work, this is the computational resources. In proof of work, it needs to control a large, por a large portion of the stake. In delegated proof of stake, it's more, it's more refined, it's more subtle. So this is trustless. This is a trustless uh, agenda, and why, why it is good. So first, maybe why, why is it bad? Um, it's very expensive to be trustless. So if you're paranoid, if you want to verify every single bit of the system, this causes the main scalability limitations. Okay, so for instance, in, in Bitcoin, every node verifies everything. So this is one limitation. And moreover, every node, um, at least originally, stores all the data, all the historical data, for the sole reason that if you, um, let's say, jo join in 2018 to the Bitcoin network, the assumption is we have to prove to you the validity of the entire history. So imagine this is a very radical and strict paradigm. Someone missed out Bitcoin for 10 years. That's OK. Maybe he was young. Maybe he was conservative. And then 10 years later, he joins the network. And then he asks everyone to, to, send, to prove the entire history was correct. And this assumption implies that in these 10 years between 2009 and today, we all stored everything just to accommodate this new, this new node, uh, to, to, help him, to help it on board. So this is part of the trustless you know, scalability limitations. Of course, people understand that it's not sustainable. So there's uh, pruning, pruningful nodes. Uh, there's sharding, where ev not everyone verifies everything. But all of these are, um, are relaxing the trustless agenda. Right? So any solution to scalability in this manner is essentially saying, OK, you have to trust something in order to play the game. For instance, if you're a new node, you have to trust that everything's OK so far. We'll get to it maybe later. So I, I, saw, I thought maybe to, sh to share with you some uh, tweets or messages of community leaders why trustless is important. So Zuko, if, if you're not familiar, he is, he's a CEO and founder of, of uh, Zcash. And his nice statement is, my position is we should reduce reliance on X. It's true for all X. Meaning this is like, we don't want if, if we can uh, remove trust for, of any sort, we should remove it. So this is Zuko's um, um, sort of one of his uh, quotes I like. And then there's another, a longer quote by Greg Maxwell, former CTO of Blockstream. And this is an interesting uh, statement. I've found it some Bitcoin dev list. And he says, not that justifies, justified trust is a bad thing, but trust makes system brittle, opaque, and costly to operate. Trust failures uh, result in systemic collapses. Um, and naturally arising trust choke, choke points can be abused to deny access to the process. 
So this is a more um, holistic view that trust is maybe justified, can be justified, can be operated in a good manner, but, but it's very costly in and of itself. So maybe trust is, is uh, cheaper. That's at least um, what's hinted here. This is uh, another argument. So in the latest, there's a latest uh, scandal in blockchain industry, um, some would say regarding EOS, um, where some block producer had, has been uh, supposedly abused or harassed. And the insight here is that these, in EOS, there's some uh, committee that votes um, about stuff. I, don't, I won't get into the detail. But the fact that these, their identities are not anonymous means that people can, you know, WhatsApp you, hey, why didn't you vote like I did? Um, you know, you can get an email, someone can knock on your door. It's not like proof of work. Proof of work, you have these, this bunch of miners, you're not sure where they are, where they're coming from. Some of them have explicitly covert, covert setups. So you don't know who they are. You can't, um, you can't approach them if they're not willing, uh, if, if they're not accepting that. So it's, it's another reason why trustless has value. Um, and another final argument is that everyone, uh, every user trusts things, but we don't trust the same thing. So in, in, um, in China, WeChat Pay and Alipay are extremely common, but in the US they are not. In Europe, uh, I guess um, they are not. So in short, users trust, but they don't trust the same things. So that's one main reason why you want a trustless paradigm, trustless platform. Interest, interestingly, uh, there are um, trust points even in blockchain. So there's an interesting um, lecture by a sociologist a researcher from Durham University, um, which goes to explain uh, how trust is actually um, how users actually, when they use a system, need to rely on trust. This is something that maybe devs don't understand as users understand. So for instance, she highlights the fact that if there's a hack in Bitcoin, the users perceive it as a hack. Devs perceive it as this wasn't a hack on the Bitcoin protocol. It was a hack on the way you used it. But the user doesn't care about this distinction. So this is an interesting gap between how devs view the system and how uh, users view it. I recommend following her work. Um, there are other ways to see that uh, trust, to, to utilize trust in Bitcoin system. The main idea is if you want to scale up the system, as I said previously, you have to give up on some assumptions. The most common one, which Satoshi himself already um, uh, proposed it's this SPV node. SPV node is a node. Um, so if you're, let's say, a, a, a home user and you're not interested in verifying everything, but you're still somewhat paranoid and you want to verify that your transactions are included in the blockchain, what you do is you open a node and you ask people to send you, you ask peers to send you the blockchain. You verify only that you got the most updated version of the blockchain. You don't verify everything. And you verify that your own transactions are embedded in the blockchain. So again, you verify two things. You verify that you got the most recent blockchain uh, version. And you verify that your transaction is accepted. But you're not verifying that, that everything is correct. And an another interesting point is when you connect to the Bitcoin network, how do you know, how do you know who, that you're getting the right Bitcoin. So let's say I convince you to onboard on Bitcoin, and then I send you some, some Ethereum uh, blockchain. So, so the, the way you have to have some anchor of trust, some external anchor of trust, where you, you, know, you call your friend, you say, hey, I, I connected to the Bitcoin network. Here's the hash of block number. Uh, this is the, the block height. Here's its hash. Am I, am I observing? Am I viewing the right network? 
So this is, this is something that you know, is another trust point in, uh, in Bitcoin and in any system. So you can't totally eliminate trust. Um, I'll skip some, some things. There's a lot of talk in the Bitcoin community about layer two. I'm sure you heard of, you heard of Lightning Network. In Lightning Network, there's, um, it's, a, it's a huge boost to scalability. On the other hand, there's some limitations. Uh, one limitation is that the user needs to be online after uh, the, for, a certain line, for a certain period of time after the transaction is uh, after the channel um, or after it operates tr transactions. And the way you really do it is you ask someone else to watch for you, to, to have your back, for instance, um, essentially. So this is like Watchtower and Lightning Network. This is also a point of trust. Uh, there are some, in coin custody, there are some protocols of, of trust where you, you ask the exchange to hold your, your coins for you. Um, let me finish with um, the general framework of, of trust and some computer science uh, point of view. So in general, there's two layers in Bitcoin. There's the base layer, the, the, the hardcore protocol, um, and this needs to be trustless. It needs to be trustless for the, for the various reasons we mentioned. And, and more than trustless, or in addition to trustlessness, it has to have another property, and that is simplicity. So I don't have the time to do the survey here, but I'm sure many of you can explain or can, can look in Wikipedia very shortly how Bitcoin, uh, the consensus protocol on Bitcoin works. Everyone creates, everyone creates a, a block, and there's the longest chain. But new, new protocols for scalability, like proof of stake, um, like other protocols, are less, less easy to, to, uh, to convince. I'm not sure how many people here understand proof of stake. So it's, when you don't understand, it's, it's harder to, to build trust. But from the user point of view, user doesn't need to have trust in the protocol, needs to have trust in the entire ecosystem. Okay, so there's the, the devs and the technical community, which needs to trust the protocol, and then the user, which needs to trust the entire ecosystem that operates correctly. Um, I don't have time to, for more details about this, but in DAG Labs, we are implementing such paradigms of two layers um, and trying to tackle various scalability and to, and to, to choose a good trade-off between um, total trustlessness and high scalability. So thank you for your listening.